Good morning, church. Uh, good morning, church. There, come on, there it is. There it is. My name is Pierce. If I haven't met you, had the honor to meet you, Net. I'm one of the pastors here. And uh, it is so good, and I mean this deeply, to be back in the traditional service. Um, last week, doing welcome announcements, just being here with the band and the music and with you all. And now, again, this week, having the honor to preach. And one of the reasons I say it's so good to be back is because this is home for me. I mean, this is where I grew up. Now, I'm not from the Woodlands. Uh, I'm from South Georgia. But uh, the traditional worship service is where I grew up. It's where I came to know Jesus. It's what uh, people would say, you know, Jesus may live in your hearts, but your grandparents, they live in your bones. It's one of my favorite sayings. One of my absolute favorites. I'm actually a fourth generation minister of the, of the Methodist movement. My great-grandfather was a Methodist pastor um, in the North Georgia Conference and then got moved to the South Georgia Conference. My grandmother, his daughter, which this is crazy. This is a little side note. This is crazy, a little family history. After my grandmother passed away in 2018, we found out that she was adopted. We had no idea. My dad had no idea. His brothers had no idea. So this minister in North Georgia adopted this baby. They moved to South Georgia. And at 12 year, 11, 12 years old, she became the piano player for Friendship United Methodist Church in deep, deep, deep South Georgia. And then my dad later would become a pastor in the Methodist movement. And when I say that um, the traditional space is, it was not this big of a room. In fact, Friendship United Methodist Church is probably the size of this section right here. And y'all would have doubled attendance for us um, on most Sunday mornings. And so from the time I was zero to six, that's where I grew up. And my grandmother, who, like I said, at 11, 12 years old, was the piano player, moved to become the organist and moved from the organist to the whole choir director and finally retired around the age in her mid-80s. The only four years that she was not the weekly piano player, organist, or choir director was her four years of college. That was it. And most days, most Sundays, she would even come back for that. And so when I grew up at Friendship, by that moment, that was the church my great-granddad pastored last and I would come in and I would sit on the pews and I would listen. And then after the children's moment, right, all the children, what? They, they left. They'd go to the children's service. And so I would go back. But I got to sneak back in toward the end of the sermon every Sunday and sit on one of the first few pews. And my grandmother would be in the organ. And it was the organ setup where she faced the choir. You know, she looked at y'all, and there was a mirror that she could see all of y'all. And, uh, and so she would look at me on the front row in the last song, and I would get the nod. And the nod meant I could go up into the choir loft and sit on her right side as, um, and watch her play the organ. I would watch her hands just magically go across. I mean, come on, right? Look at those eyes. Yeah. She's probably on to getting on to me. I never, like, I never did my hands right. I always lay, laid them lazy. She always got on to me. But this is where we started. And she had a piano in her house. She had an organ in her front living room. And that's where I grew up, having the hymns sung to me as we uh, grew up in this time. And we're in this series. That's why I'm so excited. We're in this series called Life Song. Two weeks ago, uh, Dr. Jeff Olive, Reverend Dr. Jeff Olive, started us off in this idea of in the wrestling and we looked at the hymn, Come, O Thou Traveler, as he looked at Jacob and Esau and compared that and looked and contrasted that to John and Charles Wesley, the founders of the Methodist movement. He reminded us, us that as Methodists, we are singing people. That is who we are. Last week, Bishop Hayes on Father's Day did hymns of our father. What's the theology of God our father that has been taught us on holiness, faithfulness, and caring? And today, I want to look at what God has taught me through the hymns, but specifically through one of my favorite hymns of all of Scripture. Now, it's a hymn that you may not go, well, yeah, that's a great one. That's a great hymn. That's one, of my, that's one we grew up on. It's not a song, but it's a moment, as Margarita read earlier. It's out of Acts. It's Paul and Silas being thrown in jail. And at midnight we find them singing and praising God. But before we get to that moment, let's back up just a few steps and figure out how they ended up in this spot in the first place. 
We start our story in Acts 16. Paul is out and he is, he's doing what he does. He is preaching the gospel. He's going from town to town to town. And it's him and it's Silas. And most theologians believe that Luke, who wrote Acts, was with him as well. And in early moments of chapter 16, they pick up a fourth brother. And they pick up this young man named Timothy. Remember, Timothy is known to be faithful in the word and in the ways of Jesus that was first established to him in his what? Grandmother. And so they go from town to town to town, preaching their way through the the Roman Empire, and they land in Acts 16 in a place called Philippi. Now, Philippi was a Roman town, uh, a colony that if you wanted to go into Turkey and to that side of the world from Rome, you had to pass through Philippi. It was a metropolis. It was a city bursting, having a lot of things. But what's one of the things that's interesting is there was no synagogue for the Jewish people there. So that doesn't mean that there were no Jewish people in Philippi, just not enough to have a local congregation. So when Paul and Silas, Timothy and Luke show up in Philippi halfway through Acts 16, they begin to look for people, people that know who God is, who Yahweh is. And they hear that there's a prayer meeting gathering down by the water. And so they make their way down by the water. And what they find is a group of women who are praying to Jesus and praying to God. And so they begin to share the gospel with them. And this is where we're introduced to Lydia. And Lydia is a woman who works with clothes and purple linen, means the highest class of, of designer kind of things. And so Jesus, or not Jesus, excuse me, Paul and Silas, they they share the gospel with Lydia and she connects it to what the Spirit has been doing in her and she gets baptized and her whole house gets baptized. And then she, out of her hospitality, welcomes the four of these men into her home. And so they go and while they are in Philippi, Lydia's home with her family is their home base. And in the morning they would wake up and they would go out day in and day out and preach among the streets of Philippi. And as they're doing that, they come across another woman. Now, this woman had an oracle. She was an oracle. She had a demon, a spirit that could predict the future. And so these other two men had taken her and almost uh, prostituted her for this ability that she had and began to use her to gain money for them. So they worked her to, to predict the future. They received the income. But what happened was, I don't know if you know this, when you take the gospel message into a counter gospel congregation, not congregation, but community, things begin to stir up. And so this woman begins to follow these men around saying, hey, these are the men of the most high, son of the most high. They are telling you about the savior, how to be saved. And she's just following them day after day after day. Now get this, she's telling them what's true, but she's not really doing it the right way in a loving way. How many husbands in here can tell and wives can tell that, hey, you can say the right words, but your tone matters. Don't don't nudge, don't nudge. Look at me, come on. I'm not looking at my wife. And so after four days, Paul finally turns to her and commands the spirit to come out of her. And it says in that hour, the spirit came out of her. Which is to one point we go, praise God, hallelujah, amen, she's delivered, this is incredible. But on the other side of it, you got two men who just lost their business. And now the economy is to be infected in the town. And they go to the magistrates, to the courts, and begin to bring Paul and Silas up on charges. And this is where Paul and Silas get thrown into jail. This is the reason they're thrown into the jail they are in. Hear these words really quickly, just again, as I read Acts 16. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer commanded the guard to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. Here's one of the things context-wise we need to know. That the inner jail in that day and age was the darkest, the deepest, the worst part of the jail to be put into. 
Most theologians and historians would say in that time in the world, the inner jail was at the very bottom of the jail. And not only was it at the very bottom of the jail, most of the inner jails, inner cells of the jail, were probably two to three feet um, full of the city's sewage. So now, picture the story. Peter, or Paul, and Silas, beaten, cuts, not wounded, or not, not healed, not bandaged, beaten, bloody. And the, and the chains on their arms, their legs are spread apart in wooden stocks where it's not comfortable, sitting in two to three feet of the city's sewage. And then they say, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. Does that not change our outlook, our perspective? We don't know when trials are coming, my friend. We don't know when the next pressure is going to be around us. Imagine right now, imagine waking up in the morning and turning on your local news channel or whatever uh, national news you listen to and finding out that we are again in lockdown under a worldwide pandemic. How would we handle it? Imagine tomorrow getting the phone call from the doctor that the test results were not good, that the procedure going forward is not going to be able to be had. Imagine getting a phone call this week that your loved one, who you care for, you're not going to be able to say goodbye to them because they've already left. We know that we do not determine the tragedies of this life and the suffering of this life. Most of the tragedies and sufferings that we walk through happen to us. Most of them we are given no forewarning on. But we wake up and we are in them. And what we know is this, that when we are in tragedy and when we are in suffering, is not the time to prepare. The time to prepare would have been before, and yet we never know when it's coming. So how does Paul and Silas prep for this trial? I mean, Paul is told by Jesus in the moment of his conversion that you will have to suffer for me for the ways that you treated the church before your salvation. He says this in Galatians chapter one. Hear Paul's words here. He says, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preach is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was it I taught it. Rather, I received it by the revelation from Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my previous way in the life of Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my father's. But when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, hear this church, my immediate response was not to consult any human being. I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went to Arabia and later I returned to Damascus. And this is the line that has like just centered me over the years. Then he says in verse 18, then after three years... I went to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Peter and stayed with him 15 days. I mean, Paul, who grew up as Saul, he's zealous for the faith. He is a man who is above and beyond in his class, who is not only zealous for the word of God in the Old Testament and for God, but he's persecuting the way, Jesus' way, because he doesn't believe it is the, the salvation, true salvation of the Old Testament. So he gets all of this wisdom, all of this knowledge, and then he meets Jesus. And he gives his life to Jesus. And it's this incredible moment. And most of us would say today, all right, great. Take all the wisdom, take all the knowledge, take all the stuff that you got. Now that you know it's the truth, it's the way, it's Jesus, go start preaching immediately. But he says, I'm actually going to go back for three years and distance myself and get alone with God and be rooted in who he is. Behold his glory. He's learning what it means to walk and understand the power of the gospel. Later, he writes this letter to the church in Philippi, 
The church in Acts 16 that's about to be birthed with Lydia and one other person that will finish up where in the minute. That church is going to be birthed because he was in jail. He's later in jail, later in his life, and he writes a letter back to Philippi. And he says this in Philippians 1, 12. He says, now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that as what has happened to me, meaning being in prison, has actually served to advance the gospel. And he goes on to write this in verse 21. One of the one of the lines that we hold on to as a church. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Here's what Paul is doing in his life as he prepares for the trials ahead of him. He's holding the power of the gospel in one hand and the promise for eternity in the other. That's how he walked out his mission that's how he walked out his faith. That's how with the power of the gospel in one hand and the promise of eternity in the other, that's how he's able to step into communities that know nothing about Jesus that's actually gonna hurt him and, 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 and oppress him and cause him to go into jail and he's gonna hold strong with the power of the gospel in one hand and the promise of eternity. That's how he's able to step in with both authority and gentleness, kindness, but also the word of the Lord for the people of God. And that's what he teaches us this morning. That's what Paul and Silas are teaching us this morning. We cannot prep for the trial because we know the trial is coming, but we can prep for the trials of this life, the temptations of this life, and the moments we find ourselves oppressed in this life and suffering if we will simply do this, focus our life on the gospel and the power of it and the promise for eternity. That's why Paul says later, he says, he is, I wish I could actually just die. You know, I wish I could just go be with God. And see face to face. I mean, see him face to face again like I did on the road. But it's for your advantage, church, he says, that I stay. The power of the gospel and the promise of eternity. That's how he preps. That's how we prepare. Not knowing when the phone call will come or the diagnosis or whatever the news channel will tell us. I remember in the, middle, in the middle of COVID, this um, phrase came up, kept coming up, and I just remember sitting with it, and I, I don't know who said it, and it was probably said way before COVID, but it's this. Hard moments do not create great persons, it reveals them. Hard moments do not create great persons, it reveals them. Meaning, when we are squeezed and pressed from all sides, whatever is within us is going to come out of us. What have we put in us, church? What have we put in us? And here's what I know. If I ask somebody, if I ask you this morning to raise your hand if you've been through a trial, uh, you would throw up your right hand, your left hand, and if you're flexible enough, I might even get a foot. You know, like, I mean, we're like, we've been through it. And some of those trials and sufferings, if we've looked back upon them, we would say, you know what? We walked through that really well. We focused on Jesus in those moments. We walked through with our heads held high. Doesn't mean we skipped through it and it was joyful and it was all happy and go lucky. No, we suffered through it, but we suffered through it with Jesus. And then we have trials in our life that we can go, hey, you know what? I walked through that season. I walked through those moments. I walked through those days and it almost took me out. I didn't walk through that trial well. And if you're in here today and you're walking through a trial and you're going, you know what, Pierce? I don't, I'm not walking through this well. We're not carrying this well right now. Friends, let me tell you, here in person and online, this is the place you walk through it with. You lean on community. You lean on one another so that they can carry you in your times of weakness. We see this with Aaron and her, with Moses. We see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego go in the furnace together. We see Jesus, even if you feel like you're alone, we see Jesus and David and Elijah and Elisha, they go out and they're lonely in their suffering, but watch what Jesus does. He says he just sends angels upon them to comfort them, to walk with them in their suffering. You are not alone in this. And so we continue at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God with the power of the gospel in one hand and the promise of eternity in the other. And suddenly there was a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison door were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains fell off. Everyone's chains fell off. 
My friends, when we hold the power of the gospel in one hand and the promise of eternity in the other, then pressure only intensifies our praise. That's what happens, church. That's what happens when we hold the power of the gospel in one hand and the promise of eternity in the other. Pressure only intensifies our holy praise before God. John Wesley says about this verse when it says they were praying and singing hymns to God and the other prisoners were listening to them. He said they were listening to them because they were singing a song of hope in a displaced place that they had never heard before. So the other prisoners were singing or listening. My friends, can I tell you that the world is listening to your life song today? How are you singing? How are you praising? So what's the outcome When we hold the gospel in one hand and the promise of eternity in the other, when when the pressure around us only simply makes us sing louder and intensifies our holy praise before a holy God, we'll hear these words in Acts 16 as the story continues. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew the sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. Now imagine this. In the middle of the jail, inner cell, it's dark, it's dungy, you can't really see In the middle of all that, what you have the prisoners in there and the jailer in there is Paul and Silas looking like crazy men singing. They're singing these hymns. And then in this moment at midnight, the earthquake happens. And I'm gonna imagine the, the singing stops for a moment and the earthquake happens and the doors fling open and all the prisoners realize that now the chains that were holding them are now gone and they're silence for a moment. And Paul Paul hears something. He hears a sword come out from its shield, from its place. Imagine the movie, imagine the scene. All he hears in the dead silence right after the earthquake is this sword coming out. And he knows that the jailer is about to kill himself. And what he does in this moment is beautiful. He cries out. Paul cries out. Do not kill yourself. We're all still here. And he teaches us this valuable lesson that we as a church and a people of God need to learn to declare the praises of God and listen at the same time. We both declare his praise and listen to the broken world around us. N.T. Wright says it this way, talking about this moment in Scripture. He says, Paul and Silas address both the very specific question the jailer asked and the deep, world deep, heart deep, God deep question, which was was practicized, they can see lies beneath. Because we in 2023, sitting here in the woodlands, we hear the jailer say, um, after the lights come in and he sees them all there, he asks this, sirs, what must I do to be saved? That's the question. But this is not a theological question. The jailer doesn't know who God is. Jailer doesn't know the gospel story. He hasn't been filled with the Holy Spirit. This is a practical question. He knows that if all of the jailers had left, he would have been killed. That's why he draws the sword in the first place, because he thinks he's going to die anyway, so let me just kill myself. Paul saves him from that moment and goes not just at how he can be saved in this world, but he answers that question for eternity. The jailer takes Paul and Silas and he takes them out and he bandages their wounds and he feeds them and he takes care of them. He comforts them. And just like Lydia, his whole household is saved. Our sacrificial and joyful praise to Jesus provides or produces saved and sanctified communities in Jesus. It takes sacrifice, but it's joyful sacrifice and praise that produces saved and sanctified communities in Jesus, all of which is only possible by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, I grew up with Mama. That's who was on the piano. That's what we called my grandmother, Mama. I grew up on on her piano and her organ for the first six years of my life. And then at six, my dad became a pastor and we moved um, over near Tallahassee, or over near Thomasville, Georgia, just north of Tallahassee. And he had four churches. 
And the four churches would meet, two of them on first and third Sunday of the month, the other two on the second and fourth month. And then on fifth Sunday, Bishop, we had fried chicken. We had uh, about 19 different deviled eggs. We had about 17, you know, it was like five people there. But I mean, they could cook. And, and so we would, we, we, we'd all gather together in a small community. And so my dad would preach in the morning, but he would also have Sunday night service, right? And so he would preach, and it was very, just a beautiful traditional service in the morning. But in the evening, it was more like a Bible study. And so the piano player would show up, and we would do this thing, you know, we all do it. We, a lot of us grew up in the church, and it was just like, hey, somebody raise a hand, call out a number, and we'll sing that hymn, right? Well, from the time I was five when my dad started pastoring to the time I was 16 years old, the closest person in age to me in any of those churches was my mom. And then my dad, and then someone a little older than my dad. And so there was no children's services for me to go to at that moment. I sat in the services. And so on Sunday nights, I would sit in these songs. And after about the third or fourth song, I would lean over to my mom. Now, they were beautiful songs. Choir, they were beautiful songs they chose. They were incredible. But I got to be honest, they were all in the minor key. They were all slow. And as a seven-year-old, that was really difficult. And so I would lean over to my mom most Sunday nights, and I would say this. Now, sometimes I got my words mixed up, and I go, Mom, please, please, can we have a beat-up song? Now, what I meant was upbeat. I meant, can we have an upbeat song? Can we got to get a little, little life in here? A little life. And we had a number of songs in which we, she would tell me the verse or the number to call out. And one of the ones that I rested on often was victory in Jesus. I mean, I would call that sucker out and we would sing it. They knew when Pierce raised his hand, minor keys were over and we were gonna have a little fun. And so when Bishop Hayes popped his head in my office a few weeks ago and said, Pierce, we're really excited to have you um, preach. And I said, man, I'm really honored. He said, what hymn are you gonna go to? I said, victory in Jesus. He goes, oh, do you know the story? And anytime Bishop goes, let me tell you something, bring out the pad, like start writing, right? And so he goes, you gotta know the story of Eugene Bartlett who wrote the song. I didn't know the story. Here's the story. Eugene Bartlett Sr. was born in 1885 in Missouri. He was a singer, a music producer, publisher, and songwriter. He wrote songs like Just a Little While, He Will Remember Me, and then one of my old favorites, actually, Everybody Will Be Happy Over There. In 19, at age 53 in 1939, he suffered a stroke that, that basically led him, left him bedridden for the last two years of his life. Had difficulty speaking, moving, everything. It was in that season of his life that he wrote Victory in Jesus from his bed bedridden, barely being able to speak. I was talking to Bob and uh, uh, Cliff earlier, and, and we were talking about this song has been sung by everybody. I mean, the Gaither Squad has like 17 renditions of it. Um, Carrie Underwood's got a great rendition of it. Merle Hagger has got an awesome rendition of it. This song has been sung, and you can put any melody to it, and you would all join in, whether it be slow or fast. And they said it's got good bones. It's got a good bones of a song. Now, here's where the story to me gets really interesting. It's the first time it was ever publicly sung. Eugene Bartlett Sr. is still alive in this moment, and his son, Eugene Bartlett Jr., is actually the one who has taken over his dad's business of hymn writing and publishing and songwriting. And Eugene Bartlett Jr., just a few, moment, or a few days and weeks after this song was written by his dad, um, is leading worship at a revival in East Texas. And the preacher gets up and preaches the message. And Eugene Bartley Jr. said just a beautiful message of the gospel and made the altar call and no one came down. And so Eugene Bartley Jr. said, I'm gonna sing my dad's new song. And he played victory in Jesus. And the history records will show that by the end of the song, the altar was full. Why? Because just like Paul, Eugene Bartlett did not forget the power of the gospel. That's why the song starts out like this. Oh, I heard an old, old story. How a Savior came from glory. How he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. And I heard about his groaning of his precious blood's atoning. 
Then I repented of my sin and won the victory. He said it the very beginning in the gospel. Mind you, he's writing this from bed. And in the other hand, he booknotes it at the very end with this verse. Well, I heard about a mansion. He is built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea. And about the angels singing and the old redemption story. And some sweet day I'll sing up there a song of victory. Now here's what's so interesting. The middle verse. Laying in a bed. Bedridden. Can't move. Can barely speak. He writes. Well I heard about his healing. Of his cleansing power revealing. How he made the lame to walk again. And caused the blind to see. And then I cried dear Jesus. Now wait. Come and heal my broken body would be the line we would all write because he's laying in bed. But he writes, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. That's what he writes. My friends, here's what I know is you have been through trials. You have suffered. Some of those you have suffered well. And some of those you have struggled to walk through. But my friends, there is a world out there that needs to know your life song. Your story. How Jesus walked with you. Whether you received the healing you wanted in the way you wanted. Or the healing was simply his presence with you in that moment. Have you shared your story? Our life is a joyful song and a joyful struggle to sing. Because here's what it does to the world. When the world hears our life song and the struggles we've walked through, it does two things. One, it reminds them that us as Christians, we walk through trials and sufferings just as they do. There is no different. Rain falls on the just and the unjust, sinner and the saint. We have been through the muck and the mire, but we have a hope that surpasses everything. So may we be a church who holds the power of the gospel in one hand and the promise of eternity in the other. And when we are tested and when we struggle and when we walk through the pressures of this life, may it do one thing. May it intensify a holy praise within us that the world can see the beauty of who Jesus is. Um, I'll end with this. I got the opportunity to be in London a few um, months ago and and be at Wesley's Chapel and, and a few different Um, places. And I picked up this book in um, the new room in Bristol, England. And a pastor had left it. And I said, you know, it was on a bookshelf and I grabbed it and they said, Hey, you can actually have that. You can buy it. And I did. And it's called a chain of prayer across the ages. It's this beautiful book of just full of prayers. And I love old books, but I also love old books that other people used to have because I can read within the margins. Hear this prayer as we end today. Oh, almighty God, whose only begotten son, as at this time did burst the bonds of death because it was not possible that he should be holden to it. Raise us, we pray thee, from the death of sin unto the life of righteousness, that at the last day when he shall shall come again in glory, we may be quickened in our mortal bodies, though the same spirit that quickened him, who was the firstborn from the dead and now alive evermore in whose name we beseech thee to hear us, O merciful and gracious Lord. Amen.